Here we go. It's a recording now. Yes, my um, computer audio microphone is not working. So I had to do it this way, called in on my phone. Do you hear two of me? Okay. I hear two of me, but that's okay. So week nine, GIGU, um, I have split it into the GI and the GU. We have the lecture notes, which are pretty detailed um, for each disorder. Um, and these are, I copy pasted into the PowerPoint. Um, so when you get to a disorder, the notes, that's what's here. And so I used that when I was recording. Um, key points are going to be what's written on here during my lecture. So about your, like for here, diarrhea, uh, your skin is going to be the main issue so barrier cream rinsing with warm water your padding dry and then also went over or rehydration therapy iv fluid therapy and how you're monitoring for rehydration so there's a lot for diarrhea so you'll see other areas that there's only a few things so this is the the main things that you need to focus on are your little scribbles. Um, and it's the same way for GU. Are there any questions of how that's set up or when you were going through it? Yeah, so the scribbles on the PowerPoint are your focus. Everything else is needed. It's under needed to understand the patho behind it, maybe some education, but those are the big, the big points. The nursing care. the different jaundices. So there's a difference on the pathophysiology, the etiology. And so what's gonna be the most uh, biggest indicator is gonna be the time frame when the jaundice sets in. And so you have, that was Lily moving my phone. Um, so you have the hemolytic disorder of the newborn. That's the HDN right here is going to usually occur after 24 hours. Um, but then the other jaundice is going to be less than 24 hours. So, um, that time frame is going to really be more of your indicator. It's not a true sign, but it can indicate which one is going on. So if the first day they're doing okay, we've given them early feedings um, to prevent the jaundice. We don't have any symptoms. Um, their temperature regulating, doing all everything fine. But then after their first day, then they start exhibiting signs, then we might need to look at HDN. Whereas um, if there's no reason for it, uh, like the 
I'm not feeling great, guys. That's why I'm not home. Um, see, this happens. Oh, the blood differences where the mom and the babies interact, the hemolytic that causes the hemolytic. Anyways, if there's no reason for that to have her, then when the baby's first born, we're going to do all these things to prevent it, especially in preterm new, uh, newborns, right? So uh, preventing it by giving them that early feeding, um, if there's no reason not to, if the baby, baby is stable, um, then they can go ahead and start eating. Um, remember when you stimulate the GI, um, they can start regulating their glucose, their hormones. Um, they can start getting rid of all of that um, I'm telling you. Um, the stuff that causes the jaundice. <laughs> the buildup of those broken red blood cells. Can't think of the term. What, baby? I'm going to <laughs> Thank you. I'm making food. You're making food? No. I know what they're doing. Um, I... I want it. I want it. I want it. Okay, give me just a minute, okay? I want it. I want it. Okay. Are there any other questions? I'm allergic. Hmm? I'm allergic. Okay. I'm allergic. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. No, mommy. <laughs> I'm allergic. Okay. I'm allergic. I'll leave that in there, baby, so there's no feedback. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Hold on, mommy. Um, the project, 
Yeah, we'll just set that right there. Um, so that's how this is kind of set up. Most what I want you to focus on are the lectures. Um, and then there's some other optional videos for these three just to get a little more patho behind it. But don't use their treatment, nursing, or whatever. Focus, use the lectures for those. Um, and this is the outline that I use to break up the lecture notes and resources. And then here we are today. Um, this is a link to the NCLEX questions for the chapters that are in, maybe I can get in here, maybe not. For the textbook chapters, the GI chapter and the GU chapter. Um, so just, I wanted to make sure that y'all knew how to get into that, but it's not just in here. So. Bring it to me. So the link for the NCLEX questions are also down at the bottom. So you've got your um, Evolve resources for maternal child, and it'll bring it up. Because this is very specific to the chapter now that we're getting into and so I wanted to make sure that um, the questions that are for the chapters are uh, a good review Um, but what I did break up and want to do with you guys is the PEDS cases. Um, so I kind of created it into a PowerPoint, but you have the links for each one of these here. But sometimes those are very slow and don't cooperate, or like we've seen with the vital signs, are slightly different. Um, these are the website is designed for, I think, pre-med students or med students. They wouldn't be in specifics right now, um, but that's not the point. Um, so I felt that it was a little bit easier to do it this way. So you all have access to this PowerPoint so that you can go through it as well. So I think there's only three or four. So this one is uh, abdominal pain in a four month old. So four month old presents two day history, colicky abdominal pain, vomiting, abdominal distension, bloody stools and increasing lethargy. Um, she's alert but has moderate distress. Those are her vitals. She has normal but dry mucus rings. No cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, cardiovascular looks good. She's got a murmur though. Chest is clear, good air bilateral. Her abdomen is distended, tender and difficult to examine. Um, she has no rashes or skin. So given the above history, what would be your differential it. diagnosis? I'm trying to stop it. You trying to stop it? Can we open it? I want to do it. Okay. 
I mean, I can help. So this is a select all. So what would be a potential? We're just narrowing down. So all of those would be potential. Um, I don't know about a regular hernia, but incarcerated, remember, might cause the blood esters. So in reviewing, so she got an air contrast enema. Uh, in reviewing the air contrast enema, air was introduced into the rectum and outlining of a section of bowels in the high rectum that folded and was reduced with reflux of air. And so what would this indicate? This one. Interception. I didn't mean to click, but so when the rectum is folded on in itself, that's when with the interception, right? It's folded inside of itself. Like a telescope, right? And remember, one of the treatments is the air contrast enema. I don't think we really do that with any other process. So the diagnostic thing was also a key there. So next is the abnormal urinalysis in a nine-year-old male. So your preceptor asked you to see John, a nine-year-old male patient. He was called back to the clinic following an abnormal urinalysis conducted at his yearly physical. Dr. Renal mentions that his findings in conjunction with his previous exam, chronic kidney disease is near the top of his differential diagnosis. Before you enter the room, your preceptor, Dr. Renal, also asks you what signs and symptoms you may be looking for in a patient with a suspected chronic kidney disease. So what would you think? Let go of mine. Would you have penal, pedal edema with CKD? Okay. What about metabolic acidosis or alkalosis? Acid or out? Okay. Someone says acidosis. All right. Would well, you have fatigue or decreased appetite? Yeah. Um, hyper or hypotension? Someone says hyper. Uh, anemia. Yeah, your name. Someone says possibly. What about polycythemia? Oh. 
Okay. And how about history of pathological fractures? Fractures. Maybe. Nausea and vomiting. Growth failure. Yes. So here we go. So we have fetal edema, metabolic acidosis, fatigue and decreased appetite, hypertension, anemia, not polycythemia, because it's kind of the opposite of anemia. Um, Pathological fractures um, due to your calcium, and then nausea and vomiting, and growth failure. So, a patient with a long standing chronic kidney disease may be asymptomatic in presentation. True or false? They may be asymptomatic. Okay, we got true. Yeah, that's true. So with long chronic issues like chronic kidney disease, it the client, not it, <laughs> uh, have already developed Coping mechanisms, I guess. I don't, can't think. I told you that already. Um, so they're already in this state where they're trying to compensate. And so they're used to it. So they may be asymptomatic. They may have normal uh, vital signs, normal labs uh, until they can no longer compensate again. So Dr. Renal asked you what investigations should be completed for a patient with suspected chronic kidney disease. What investigations would be indicated? So we're looking for CKD. So what kind of things lab-wise would we want to do? A urine disc dipstick and mycoscopy. So that's a urinalysis. Yes. What about protein, urea, and albuminuria analysis? Looking for protein and albumin in the urine. Yes. What about a chest x ray? Okay, yep, chest x ray. What about a CBC? Yeah, and EKG, ECG. Someone says, oh. Uh, what about BUN? Can get out? Yeah, BUN. What about creatinine? They want to get it away. Yeah, we're gonna get this part. They want to get it out for them. Okay. No. 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 Everyone in this house is not feeling good. Everyone else in this house. Um, so we're doing a BUN, we're creatinine. What about an ABG? Yep, electrolytes. Yep, uh, alkaline phosphatase. Yep, 
lipids. And then ANA. Okay, parathyroid hormone. Okay. Yep. So some of the symptoms of CKD can also mimic, uh, at least initially for diagnosis, uh, rheumatoid and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, lupus especially, systemic lupus. So this anti-nuclear antibody, ANA, is going to be one of the things that's going to rule that out because those will be elevated in those autoimmune disorders. A lipid panel is also going to make sure with your um, albumin. So where is that albumin coming from? And if their lipids are high and they're getting rid of, we shouldn't expect it to be high, but it's also going to rule out liver and if they're having ascites symptoms. So we're differentiating it. Yep, and as Ms. Love also brought up, the Elevated lipids can cause atherosclerotic vessels, cardiovascular issues, and lead to CKD. Um, I would probably do an ABG in an acute stage. At this chronic stage, remember, they're having a lot of compensation. I mean, it wouldn't hurt, but... Um, it's not really going to tell us much right now. Be a good baseline, I guess. John's lab results are found to be remarkable for anemia, an elevated urine albumin uh, to creatinine ratio, an elevated serum creatinine, and with John's diagnosis certain, Dr. Renal probes what you know about the management of CKD. What type of diet might pediatric CKD patients need to be on? A, B, C, D, or E. Right, like Miss Love said, in the acute stage, like I said. I got it. Mm -hmm. And what kind of diet should a CKD person be on? They're all low cholesterol for the same reason. So you're not looking at cholesterol. So you're looking at a potassium and phosphate and salt. So 
So y'all have narrowed it down to low potassium because y'all are saying one or two. So then the, they're both low salt. So then we want your phosphate. High or low? Low? Yay! Yep, so if the kidneys are not properly filtering out. Hold on. Really stepped on it and pulled it out of my computer. I'm so sorry. Sorry. So if the kidneys are not properly filtering out electrolytes, uh, then those are going to be retained. So then you don't want excess. So they're going to naturally have a high potassium, a high phosphate, and a high sodium serum levels. And so we're going to try and decrease those as much as possible. So their diet is going to be the opposite of that because we don't want to increase that imbalance. Now, when it comes to fluid restrictions, that's going to be based on how much fluid they're retaining. Um, now, with other or acute issues like glomerulonephritis, uh, acute kidney injury, that fluid restriction is only going to be in oligoric stages. Hold on. Hold on. Daddy's at work. Daddy's at work. He had a patient he had to go cover for just a few minutes. I'll be back. Um, so in those acute issues, that's going to be only requiring fluid restrictions if the patient is oligoric. So if they're not putting out urine, um, that's when we're going to retain that fluid um, from them to prevent them from if they're not kicking it out then it's going to stay in so the more water we give them the more they're going to retain it so then we don't give them fluids all right this question what other conservative treatment strategies are recommended for CKD. Insulin. If they're diabetic. Epigen. Yes. Iron. Yes. Calcitril. Vitamin D3. Yes. Phosphate binders like salvin layer, yes. Sodium citrate. Yes. Systemic corticosteroids. Maybe not. Recumbent human growth hormone. Not sure. Antihypertensives. Or blood pressure medications. Yes, if they're hypertensive. I like your conditional. Supplemental nutrition. If the albumin is low, I like that. And potassium. One, two, three, four. If their potassium is low. Mm -hmm. You said their potassium is going to be high. Um, systemic corticosteroids can actually injure their kidneys. 
Uh, and so in the chronic kidney stage, we are going to avoid as many medications as we as possible that might be uh, nephrotoxic. Good job. Um, when a patient takes epigen, what do they need to make sure that they take? Remember the epigen. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated. So your oxygen. That is my oxygen. So if someone's taking epigen or epigen alpha. We need to make sure that they increase their iron intake. Um, we may need to supplement them with iron. So iron is on here as its own thing. But if you take an EPO, I want to make sure that you know that they need to be also on iron or increase their iron. Education for iron. Something. Yeah, that one. <laughs> There you go, you got the cartridge. You want me to read it? Yeah. It's so animated when you're playing with children, which seems to make their day. Good job. And monitoring for cardiovascular disease. So, which of the following regarding pediatric CKD management is true? Plus all of five. So, did you step on that box? Come here. So they're going to need dialysis and have to choose which kind. Yes. Okay. What about hemodialysis no, is superior no, to peritoneal? No, no, no. <laughs> She's telling you no. Yes, correct. Good job. Once fluid buildup becomes evident, dialysis or transplant must be considered. That's true. Their kidneys are not working. So fluid buildup. So something needs to be replaced. And if patient is on a form of dialysis, then there's no need to impose restrictions on them. False. Exercise is an important non-pharmacological management tool. Oh, uh -uh. you're going to choke me. Um, once the buildup is evident, no. options must no. be considered. No. It's still going to be considered. No. It's not saying that's when it should be first no. considered. 
So transplantation treatment of choice for pediatric zucchini. True. That's true for even adults, but especially in pediatrics because this can be life-threatening, CKD and AKD too. So the sooner we can get them a functioning filtration system um, so if dialysis is going to have to be a long-term thing, then we might need to look at transplant. You can't rely on dialysis forever, especially young children. It's definitely going to deter their growth, their um, developmental milestones. They're going to be missing school a lot. It's not good. Cardiovascular events are the most common cause of death. We have pediatric onset CKD. True. So we're looking for those cardiovascular abnormalities, especially due to the electrolytes. So monitoring those during therapy. Right. I think this is the last one. So urinary tract infection in a seven-month-old. Mother brings her seven-month-old infant to the emergency room with three days of high fever that has persisted despite regular Tylenol. She has no cough, rhinorrhea, or other symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection. She's not had any vomiting or diarrhea. She's been acting quite fussy for the past few days and was breastfeeding normally until today when she has not wanted to eat anything. Her temperature is 39 Celsius in the ED. The rest of her vitals were with the normal range. Which of the following are you considering as possible etiologies for Rebecca's fever? Could it be a viral infection? Maybe. What about a urinary tract infection? Yes. Well, the title of the section is so, but moving on. Could it be an otitis media? Cult bacteremia, bacterial pneumonia, TB. I would hope she wouldn't have that high of a fever with TB. It's usually low grade. Um, I won't suspect much of this bacterial pneumonia because she doesn't have any respiratory issues, but the other ones I would. On examination, the baby is fussy, but but consolable. Uh, 
my pet with my diary. And she has no GI issues. I wouldn't suspect that. Wouldn't have been my first thing. Again, this is med school questions, differential diagnoses, things. So, but I don't see a reason for the doctor to order that, but he might just to rule out things. is bacteria in the blood. Don't like the wording though. Because I didn't get that. Maybe it's fussy but consolable. Her head and neck examination demonstrates normal conjunctiva or pharynx and non erythematosis, non bulging tympanic membranes bilaterally. Respiratory exams, good. No retention sounds. Abdomen is benign. No rashes or swollen active joints. Joints. Uh, removing her wet diaper, you notice the urine smells quite strong. GU examination is otherwise normal. Based on your examination, you expect a UTI because of her high fever. Which of the following is the best next step? So you suspect it. What do you mean? And how are you going to do it? Choose one. Well, I'm going to go ahead and roll out the first one and last one because we are suspecting we need to confirm it. So we can't just start treating and admit or discharge. And I'm not going to do a lumbar puncture or a UTI. So then how am I obtaining the urine specimen? Clean catch, a bag urine, or we're gonna catheterize the baby. Number four, and your analysis and uh, catheterize. Any other options? Bag. Yeah, so I would think bags would be okay. If she was any other symptoms for like sepsis, then I would do a catheter. Um, so there is a plastic baggie that has little strips that are sticky that you peel off the edge like a band-aid. And so then you stick it around the genitalia and then you have the baby held upright until they pee and you can stimulate and push on their bladder give them fluids whatever it usually doesn't take long for infants you know they pee all the time 
So if um, it's not, if they're not peeing, um, they're having discomfort or any other symptoms, then I would resort to catheter to get a sample because they're not urinating. So this might have progressed to um, chylonephritis, um, glomerulonephritis, something along those lines. So Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so that's why I would start with a bag and then progress to a catheter later. So which of the following is the most specific uh, finding on a urine distip for the ETI, the urinalysis? Select all. No, we wouldn't wait for antibiotics, but we need to get the sample before we start treating. Because if you treat before you get your sample, just like with blood cultures, then you're going to possibly eradicate, irradiate any uh, bacteria that is in the system. So we want our sample before we can start treating. So if it is taking a while for the client to urinate with a bag, then we'll progress to a catheter. That way we can start treatment early and not delay it much longer. So what oh, should we find on our urinalysis? Nitrite? What else? This is a select all, I believe. Leukocytes. It might not be a select all because it's the most specific finding, but you could have red blood cells, you could have leukocytes, um, nitrite and pH are going to be the most indicative. So your nitrate is going to change. Um, based off of the presence of the bacteria. So leukocytes, red blood cells could be due to inflammatory process or um, irritation due to uh, like a kidney stone. So it's not just a UTI. UTI could develop due to stasis of urine if that stone blocks or obstructs low, but nitrite is going to be the most indicative of the UTI. So the physician decides to treat Rebecca, the infant, with IV ceftrioxone because he thinks it's unlikely that she will tolerate an oral antibiotic at this point. You're deciding on whether you should admit Rebecca to the hospital or send her home with close follow-up. Which of the following are reasons to admit the child to the hospital for treatment of the UTI? Select all. So, oops. any child under a year of age should be admitted to the hospital to receive parenteral antibiotics because Pyelonephritis is likely in this age group. Does that sound yes or no? One and three for sure, someone says. And D 
likely she can't go home with an IV this young. No, that's right. So she can't go home with an IV. Um, so one, three, you suspect four caregiver? Nah. A child over the age of three months because fever is more likely to have bacterial sores in this age group. Oops, come up. So anyone that's not tolerating, uh, it could be a pair. That's not the case in this, but I guess it's asking what would be a reason to admit. But yeah, so if the caregiver you don't believe is going to be compliant to give the child their antibiotics at home, then we might want to look for admission. Um, and then not tolerating oral, and then under four weeks. I don't remember how old Rebecca is, but I think she's going to fall under this for four. So she's not tolerating oral antibiotics, and so that's why we're going to admit her so she can get IV. So this number four applies to the situation, but again, medical school, other reasons. So that was just going through kind of the diagnostic and some of the nursing interventions. So don't forget to focus on treatments and complications of these disorders, um, and especially the nursing interactions. So like some have a lot and some don't have some little scribbles on them. So this is when I was talking about only in allegoric stages do we then prescribe a low potassium diet and uh, sodium and water restriction in, in the allegoric stage. And that's in the lecture when you watch it. Any other questions? Okay. Right. So if it's mild, then maybe a one-time dose of antibiotic could be considered, but that's up to the physician, uh, especially in older children or in adults, that could be definitely a possibility. But again, with infants and newborns, there's a very tight range of medications that you can give. And so monitoring for those complications and making sure that they get adequate dosing, appropriate dosing, um, could be a reason for admission. <laughs> so after this week, you are, should be able to do the reflux, failure to thrive, and chronic refailure of your F.A. Davis distance learning. Um, and then working on your project. 
I'm going to grandma's house. <laughs> we just came from grandma's house. I think that's what made us sick. Bring out the topics in a week. Yes, Miss Love. She said yes. Next week is Miss Love's topic. Um, there. The other group that will be attending Immersion Day tomorrow and Thursday, there will be an email to be sent out or announcement uh, as a reminder, as well as items to complete. Um, so in the week one for orientation items, do a clinical expectations document. Uh, Gets you set up. So, performing the ATI skills modules for maternal newborn assessment and pediatric assessment prior to arrival. And then everything else will be performed during. You'll be in your clinical uniform in need of paper and pencil note taking items. You won't need your backpack. You can br bring your stethoscope, um, bring your Navicent badge if you have it. Um, and a tape measure, your little paper tape if you still have it. I think the only one y'all had was in your wound care kit. Um, so if you can find it, bring that. And then that's done. I don't really have much else that I wanted to go over, so make sure that you focus on uh, my lectures, my key points in there, and the lecture notes, and I think you'll be set just fine. I have appointments that I put on the calendar for Friday because we'll be in immersion day Wednesday and Thursday. Um, but you can shoot me an email if you have any questions that come up. And we'll just be done. Oh, right. I was looking at my husband yesterday and I was like, what is on Friday? I can't remember what's on Friday. It's not on my phone calendar. Yes. Inplex review on Friday. So I'll have my question set up. Thank you. All right. I'm going to try and stop recording. Well, have a great week. Let us know if you need anything.